Uh, welcome to the uh, Monday, June 15th, 2015 regular meeting of the Glendale Parks Recreation and Community Services Commission. Roll call, please. Commissioners Kalfayan? Yes. Vaughn is absent. Sharkey? Here. Who? Present. President Flood? Uh, here. Uh, upcoming count. Uh, next item, please. Uh, it's report of recording secretary regarding posting of the agenda. The agenda for the June 15, 2015 regular meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside City Hall on or before Friday, June 12, 2015. And item two is upcoming council agenda items. Yes, President Foud, um, coming up uh, tomorrow evening on June 16th under consent calendar, uh, we have a motion authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement to accept a grant from the County of Los Angeles in the amount of $155,000, which will go towards the purchase and installation of outdoor fitness equipment at three of our park facilities, um, at, at uh, Cedar Park Heritage Garden, at the Adult Recreation Center, and at Pacific Park, and then a companion resolution of appropriation to, to budget those funds in the city budget. Um, under the action calendar, we have a motion authorizing the city manager to execute a contract agreement with Phoenix Decorating in the amount of $190,000 plus a 5% contingency for the design and construction of the city's 2016 rose float, which you will hear more about in a few minutes, and then a motion approving the, the float design itself in the name, which is currently getting there is half the fun. That's the name of the proposed float. And then the city council will be dark for three weeks, and then coming back on July 14th under the consent calendar, we will have an item which will be a motion to approve and award a, a construction contract for Riverwalk Phase 2 project, and a, another agenda item also under the consent calendar, which would be a, a motion to approve an award of a constr construction contract for the Brand Park Wayfinding Project. And that is it. Thank you. Next item. Item three, commission staff comments. Any comments? Okay. Uh, just uh, for Glendale Parks and Open Space Foundation, our Dodger Night fundraiser was a complete <laughs> success. So much fun, and I want to thank everyone who supported us. And it was just a great night. And the foundation's last fundraiser of the year is coming up. Uh, Glendale City Golf Tournament, and that's on August 20th. You can go to our website, any website. We're on Facebook, on the Parks uh, um, website, and also Glendale Parks Foundation. And it's August 20th at Shoal Canyon, and then the finalist round at the prestigious Oakmont Country Club. So if you'd like to support us and you play golf, it's, it's also a wonderful event. So that's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, next item. Yes. Oh. President Todd. Uh, we have a number of staff comments that we would like to, to share with, with the Commission uh, today with your indulgence. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. Ponosian to give us an update on the Montrose Oakmont Tennis Court resurfacing schedule. Uh, Mr. Bulanikian to give you an update on the summer programs. This is the busiest time of year for our department, and so we'd like you to know uh, what's going on on that front. Then I'd like Teresa to give you a preview of uh, a suspension policy discussion that we would like to have with you next month. Then Iris will um, quickly review the department calendar of events. So we'll start with uh, Mr. Panosian on the tennis court resurfacing schedule. Thank you, Mr. Dren. Uh, good afternoon, President Fodd, members of the commission. As you know, we've embarked on a resurfacing program at our tennis court and basketball courts. We've done several resurfacing this year already. What we had on the docket was Oakmont uh, view tennis courts as well as the Montrose tennis courts for resurfacing. Uh, we did have a little glitch with the contractor scheduling of it. They were supposed to be uh, resurfaced about two weeks ago. Once we got all the scheduling back on track, we had Montrose court, the lights for the tennis court also painted so that they, with the tennis courts being redone, the poles looking old wouldn't suffice. The poles were in good condition. The lights are decent. So we had those uh, painted as well as the courts being resurfaced this week. Uh, we're looking at about a week of, of 
doing some prep work and uh, repainting for the Montrose tennis courts. Oakmont will be open during this time. As soon as Montrose is ready for open, likely by next Monday, we will switch off, we'll open Montrose for uh, the use for the public, and then we'll switch over to uh, Oakmont view courts to have those resurfaced. Each one of them have two tennis courts. And we're looking at maintaining this on a more annual basis, three to four courts identified, and resurfaced for you know, better play and safety of the public. And how's Fremont going? Fremont is complete and open for operation, so uh, we have a lot of happy tennis players now in Fremont. Thank you. Mr. President Foud, um, in addition, Gabriel Golia will give us an update on the Fremont Park tennis court operation as well. Um, a few yeah. items down on the agenda. So next we have Mr. Bulanikian. Uh, President Foud, members of the commission, our summer uh, program started last uh, Monday, June 8th. Uh, staff hired over uh, 85 hourly employees. Um, our hiring process started in late December, and uh, we got all of our hourly employees approved, ready to work by May 15th. Um, our summer day camp program, which is held at Pacific Community Center, Maple Park Community Center, Spar Heights, Verdugo and Griffith Manor, uh, started last Monday. We have over 420 campers each week for the next eight weeks. Um, most of our uh, day camps are full. Um, we do have waiting lists on three of our day camps. If anyone is interested, they can sign up at Verdugo or Griffith Manor. We do have some spots available at those uh, day camp locations. Uh, Pacific Community Pool Open Memorial Day. Um, we have a number of swim lessons, recreation, swimming, and team sports available uh, every day. Uh, we, um, as always, the pool is very busy. Our lessons are full. We do have some spots available for the later sessions in the summer. Uh, but um, we open Memorial Day with an easy uh, opening. We have our waiting pools open. We have uh, Brand, Palmer, Glen Oaks, Dunsmore, and Fremont. Uh, they're open. It varies, but most of our waiting pools are open Monday through Thursday between 12 and 5 and Fridays between 1.30 and 6.30. We also have a free summer lunch program uh, with Glendale Unified. We're collaborating with Glendale Unified Food Services, and uh, that's held at Pacific Park Monday through Friday between 11.30 and 12.30 at the picnic shelter. Uh, July 3rd, uh, there won't be any food served because of the holiday, but we get about 150 to 160 children per day um, under 18 uh, that get a free meal. Back by popular demand, we have our summer concert series starting at Verdugo Park, uh, North End, starting July 1st. It'll run through August 5th, between 6.30 and 8.30. Uh, we have a variety of uh, different type of music being played, so come on out um, at Verdugo Park between 6.30 and 8.30. And then last but not least, July 18th, we're having our 22nd annual cruise night on Brand Boulevard. We're featuring three bands this year, the Chantes, Jumping Jack Flash, and the Smooth Sounds of Santana. Uh, the show will start at 5.30 and end at 10.30. A question on Bruce Cruz. Did you see any improvement in uh, entrance with the changed uh, entrance fee? As of uh, this afternoon, 2 p.m., we have 160 vehicles. We're hoping to get another 100, 150. Uh, we um, mailed out 960 flyers, uh, registration forms. Uh, this morning, actually, so we're hoping to get um, last-minute push. Can you tell at this um, time whether the fee change has made any difference? Um, it has. It has. We have uh, last year at this time we had 80 vehicles signed up, Excellent. and this year we have 160. So we've doubled. So we're hoping to get about 280 to 300 vehicles for this year. Thank you. President Fwad, members of the commission, good afternoon. Uh, just wanted to provide a brief update. We'll, staff was working on revising the department suspension policy or uh, establishing various levels of um, offense and categorizing the violations into the various levels and also incorporating um, a policy where the police department will be able to help us enforce our rules when um, either they get a call or, or the bike patrol is in our parks and they see that they may not be doing something, either they're violating a municipal code or, or some sort of a state code, but also the department policies. So we're working on revising the suspension policy and we'll be before you probably next month with, uh, with a draft policy for your review and approval. Okay, and President Fraud, members of the commission, I'll go through our calendar of events shortly here. 
Um, some of them have already been mentioned, but I'll just go through it quickly. Um, so Monday, June 8th through Friday, August 7th, summer day camps are going on um, for information or to sign up. People can call 818-548-2184. Uh, today, the water play features at Cerritos and Pacific Park were turned on. That's a, we get a lot of questions about that. Uh, Friday, June 19th from 5.30 p.m. to 10 p.m., we're having a tea night out at Pacific Community Center. Saturday, June 20th, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., we have a wilderness work day at Duke Majan Wilderness Park. On Sunday, June 21st, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., uh, we're having a Hawaiian fun at the Tea House at Brandt Park. Wednesday, July 1st, 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., the summer concerts in the park series begins at the north end of Verdugo Park. Friday, July 3rd, 5.30 p.m. to 10 p.m., we have another tea night out at Pacific Community Center. Saturday, July 11th, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., we have a Riverwalk Workday at Riverwalk. Saturday, July 18th, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., Wilderness Workday at Duke Majan. And Saturday, July 18th, 5.30 p.m. to 10 p.m., Cruise Night on Brand Boulevard. And for more information, people can call our administration office at 818-548-2000. Thank you. Is that all? If, if so, a next item, please. Okay. The next item is item four, oral communications. Uh, I don't have any cards, so there's no I cards from the audience. Next item. Item five, consent items. Uh, approval of the minutes of the commission regular meeting held on April 20th, 2015. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? I move it. <clears throat> I'll second it. Commissioners Kalfayan. Yes. Khan is absent. Sharkey? Yes. Wu? Yes. President Foy? Yes. Next item, please. Item six, action items at A Park Services Drought Response Plan at one motion to review and provide feedback regarding the proposed Park Services Drought Response Plan. President Floyd, members of commission, uh, we are here in front of you today to present uh, the plan that we put together and as a response to the drought we've been experiencing. We've heard a lot about the drought in recent years and the governor's executive order wanted to tell you what Park Services has done along with the city council ordinances that are in play and what we have planned for the coming uh, months as we go forth. We've put together a brief presentation for you. So as you've heard, likely on April 1st, the governor issued an executive order, B-2915, which is, for the first time in California's history, mandated water restrictions of the use of water. And the goal is to have a 25% reduction of water use and through February 2016. And the base year for this will be 2013. So governor also directed the water board to look at every watering agency and identify uh, the use consumption for that specific year and a percentage of reduction. For Glendale, uh, we have to achieve 20% reduction compared to our 20, 2013 usage. This is Glendale City as a whole. But given the fact that Glendale Water and Power and us in and, and the parks ourselves, we have taken proactive measures of instituting the ordinance, the phase two conservation methods through the council. We are already looking at about 12% consumption reduction past uh, as compared to the 2013 but we still have some work to do we do need to achieve another eight percent reduction across the city is that 12 percent just city versus residents in the city that is 12 percent overall in the city of glendale including the city as well as the residents because i i was talking to somebody at the city uh, administration of office last week and they thought glendale had reduced their usage by 26 percent already these were the numbers we last had from the Glendale Water and Power Report. We'll definitely take a look at it. Okay. But if you do compare it to past percentages, Glendale has been very proactive in, uh, you know, implementing the ordinances. Oh, and no, phase I don't reductions. doubt that. I just I got a different number from it. We'll, we'll double check that. But from the last report we had at council, it was 12 12 percent already reduced from 2013. And we have a little bit of ways to go. Yeah. OK. So on 27th, it should be 28th of April, I believe 28th was a Tuesday, the City Council adopted the ordinance placing Glendale on Phase 3 water conservation. It actually added a little more restrictions. Uh, one being is no watering for 48 hours after measurable precipitation, after some rain to turn all the irrigation clocks off for 48 hours. No watering of ornamental turf on public street medians. This is the governor's executive order. It stipulates this as an executive order for us no longer to water ornamental turf with potable water. 
uh, limited outdoor irrigation of landscapes to no more than two days per week. Phase two was three days a week. Now it's further been restricted to two days per week, as well as identifies the days as Tuesdays and Saturdays for watering. Now, community services and parks, given our unique operation, uh, we do have, we have been granted an exemption from the following restrictions. That is watering days from Saturday to Tuesday, and I'll explain further as to why, and watering only two days per week, 10 minutes per station. Uh, the ordinance grants the director of community service and parks with approval of the Glen general manager of the Glendale Water and Power, discretion over the watering days given our unique needs. And with that, it allows us, the Community Service and Parks Department, the ability to deliver on our mission, which is to provide safe and well-maintained parks and uh, recreational facilities. So the director may choose the watering days that are best suited for the operation. As such, we believe the Glendale residents are best served if we maintain, continue to maintain the three days of watering per week, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Sunday nights from 10.30 p.m. to 6 a.m. 10.30 p.m. is selected because 10 o'clock the parks close. We wait till everybody clears out. And some of our facilities are so large that it does literally take all the way through 6 a.m. to get to every station to be able to water. Before I move on, the reason why I've selected Sundays versus the Saturdays, because we don't have any irrigation technicians working on Sunday morning. So if we have a, a broken sprinkler or if we have a broken line or one of our valves gets stuck on, we'll be wasting a lot of water until we get crews to get to it. If we're watering Sunday night through Monday morning, by that time we have crews. So if we do have any valves that are stuck and we are losing water, we have a full crew to be able to get to it and patch you know, any leaks that we may have immediately to control the water more efficiently this way. And you're doing it three days a week, not two. We are. We, 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 we are being allowed to maintain the phase two watering schedule, which is on three days, uh, given that we, have, we, we serve a unique purpose for the community and to allow for us for recreation and quality of life issues such as ball fields and, and recreational uh, amenities that we provide for the community, given that it's a quality of life issue, we are maintaining it at the three days. Now, we have taken other measures to supplement that extra day, and we'll go through that you know, as we go forth. Now, past several years, we've put already a number of reduction measures, water use reduction measures in place. We've been implemented. First one is, during the winter months, we, if it gets a little moist and it gets a little cold, we turn off our clocks, our irrigation clocks, and try to keep it shut as long as we can, given that in the cold, not a lot of the landscaping is going to grow. Grass doesn't grow when it's cold. Most grasses you'll see actually turn dormant in the cold. They don't need water, and because of the cold weather, they sustain themselves. We turn the water off and only turn it on as necessary. After rains, we already turn the water off, so we've been practicing that for the past several years. We had in the past installed waterless urinals. I believe we've done six of them at three or four facilities, and going forward, we'll be looking at that option at a lot of other restrooms as well, seeing uh, the benefit. It reduces 15,000 gallons per urinal annually if we have waterless urinals. Now, on the flip side of it, there's, there's the cost of the cartridges that we have to buy, and they tend to be expensive, about $100, $150 each. Because you don't use water to clean them, it's a cartridge that must be replaced every maybe about four times a year or so. There's a cost element associated with the urinals, um, waterless urinals, but at the same time, it's being a good steward of you know, conserving water. There's a balance. We've gone into conver the conversion of our planter beds to drought tolerant landscapes. Uh, we do a lot of mulch application in our planter beds at numerous facilities. You've seen some of those examples in the past uh, uh, projects we presented to you. We use low flow sprinklers in the, in the field. We replace or repair old and leaking valves and we make priorita we prioritize the irrigation leak to repair them as soon as we, we have been notified of them. And Glendale Water and Power with the new smart meters they have in place if we have a leak, they actually contact us immediately and say, we actually have a constant flow of water here, which we appreciate. Sometimes we don't see it. And sometimes the water is leaking underground and we don't notice it. So when they do email us with that information about the site, whether it's a median, whether it's a park, we send our crews out there to investigate and you know, patch the leaks. It's been very helpful. Some former turf removal projects we have conducted in past years in Brand Park, right across the doctor's house. There used to be a turf area there, now it's, it's mulch. This was several years ago. You may not have noticed it, but that large turf area had been mulched already. In Palmer Park, if you had visited Palmer Park in the past, on the south side and west side where we have some mature trees, it used to be turf. 
Um, those two areas have been converted to mulch over the past couple of years. Shoal Canyon, we've only kept turf in the ball fields. Any outlying area of the ball fields have been converted to mulch. And most recently, the sports complex, we eliminated turf areas between fields one and two that we mulched uh, as part of the uh, turf uh, removal program at the Metropolitan Water District. Other actions we've implemented, sites that are actually before going to the other sites. Um, ir irrigation that uses recycled water to water is exempt from the executive order. So as such, some of our medians that we have listed here, Brand Boulevard, uh, Colorado Street, Glendale Avenue, from Monterey to Glen Oaks, uh, Glen Oaks Boulevard, the whole stretch of Glen Oaks Boulevard from Brand to Alameda, and then certain green belts in the intersection of Brand and Glen Oaks, Pacific and Glen Oaks, and Parque Vaquero, those are irrigated with recycled water, so they are exempt from the, the order. And so on those sites, even though we'll be maintaining the watering schedule as our normal watering schedule, we won't be removing the turf from these sites. We'll keep them as turf. We'll just be posting signs that, that say, let the public know these are being irrigated with reclaimed water. Most of those sites actually have those signs. As I was driving, Brent, it looks like some of those stretches are missing signs. We'll work with our uh, public works facilities folks to install signs at every uh, intersection. That way, folks know that every one of those intersections being recycled, uh, used uh, recycled water to irrigate. Now, we also have certain parks that are uh, irrigated with reclaimed water. Uh, thus, they are also exempt from the ordinance. Even though they're exempt, we're still maintaining the three-day watering schedule. We're not increasing the watering just to still be good stewards of um, the, and also for part public perception. Uh, we're not watering daily. Adult Recreation Center, Central Park, Brand Park is irrigated with reclaimed water, Cerritos Park, Lower Shoal Canyon Park, Glendale Sports Complex, Glen Oaks Park, Pacific Community Center, Pelham County Park, and Shoal Canyon Ball Fields. And these are large size facilities that are, we're using reclaimed water. Now, the question tends to be is why don't we use reclaimed water at all of our facilities? The simplest answer is the infrastructure is currently not there. The water delivery system of recycled water is not available at all of our sites. And I know one of Glendale Water and Power's goals are in the future to look at some uh, grant funds available to start working on that infrastructure. Uh, we'd love for all of our sites to be on recycled water um, for the landscaping. Now, we also have quite a few medians that are irrigated with potable water, uh, and the goal is to address them in two different phases. The first phase is we want to turn the water off and start controlling the consumption of water. Uh, we are going to be spraying the turf and using Roundup, removing the turf. We want to modify the irrigation to continue watering the trees and the shrubbery. Uh, it, we can't just turn the water off. It will not be responsible of us because we have a lot of trees. Some of them quite a bit mature, and others are just, you know, still trying to uh, grow to a mature tree. So all those, we're going to be modifying irrigation to make sure we maintain them and applying thick layers of mulch. That is phase one. But what, are, what are some examples of these? these I will be showing examples in, in a couple of minutes, uh, President Floyd. And phase two, we're going to come back with a drought-tolerant landscape planting in most of those cases and installing DG in some cases. Here will be a couple of examples. Um, at these locations, we're actually completed with the first phase. Uh, Adams Square Triangle, I'll show you pictures of them so you get a better picture of it. 672 square feet of turf was removed. Mountain and Royal Intersection, 3,560 square feet. Verdugo Road, we've split them into two because there are two areas. One is in front of Shriners, there's a parking lot and a turf area. If you drive it, you will notice at 3,200 block, 5,600 square feet of turf was removed from that area. And Verdugo Road, north of La Crescenta, all the way to Broadview, 27,476 square feet of turf was removed. Broadway-Wilson intersection, this is just south of the two freeway, actually I should say the 134 and 2 in that intersection, the, the crossover, 8,000 square feet of turf, Glendale Avenue, Long Island, this is um, above Glen Oaks and below Mountain. 4,000 square feet of turf, and, and Monterey Road, 3,634 square feet of turf. On Monterey Road, uh, we're already in the process of putting decomposed granite because it's right in front of the school, and mulch isn't really going to sustain itself. It's a small uh, planter area that we have mature trees, so once we've changed the irrigation, modified it, staff, as a matter of today, as a matter of fact, they're actually finalizing the decomposed granite installation at this site. So thus far, from the medians, we've removed a total of 52,987 square feet of turf. 
We've also assisted Glendale Water and Power at a couple of their sites. Uh, Glendale Water and Power also turned off all the water to all their sites. A couple of them, we started working together, like the Glorieta substation, 1,500 square feet of turf, Grandview pump station, 3,200 square feet, and Western Reservoir. There's approximately 25,000 square feet of turf there that we're assisting Glendale Water and Power in its removal and uh, going forward, a uh, plan to change uh, the landscape into something more consistent. So here's an example of the Grandview pump station, which is on San Fernando Road. That we used this one as first because we had more pictures of the specific steps that we're taking. First step was to spray out the turf. As you notice, this has already started turning brown. It kills the turf. And we come in uh, with heavy equipment and remove all the turf. And once the turf is removed, uh, there won't be much grading necessary, but maybe a little in some cases, because at this site and two other Glendale Water and Power sites, we actually use little rock uh, to be able to uh, cover the landscape. So currently, this is what the Grandview pump station looks like. Adams Square, this is one of our uh, contracted landscape areas. You see two, two locations uh, identified here. And both those areas had turf. One is at the intersection of Adams and the other one intersection of Tyler. Uh, you see a, a before and after. You see there are little turf areas. Um, mm -hmm. Removing the little turf areas and installing DG kind of helped uh, bring us to the goal that we wanted to achieve. And in some cases, you see the pictures, specifically the one on the left, it, the pointer doesn't show. We will likely not landscape that. We'll leave it as mulch under the tree, let the tree you know, grow into uh, you know, a mature tree, and it's not necessary. There will be some areas that we will not come back with a landscape plan and just leave it as mulch. Here is the uh, one, I believe, maybe the Tyler intersection. Again, we have a tree there, and uh, we have removed the turf and mulched under the tree. Here's what they look like. Very clean. Uh, in some cases, again, we may install a couple of drought-tolerant landscape plants, and in most cases, likely not. How often do you have to refresh the uh, mulch? Um, we, we'll have to watch it very closely, President Fouad, because sometimes mulch deteriorates faster. It'll change color. It'll still do the job, though. So it gets to a point where it starts decomposing quite a bit. Uh, we'll have to refill the mulch. Yeah, like once a year? Once every Likely years? once a year. Once a year, we may have to consider it. Uh, one, Sometimes it could be longer than a year, so we have to keep a close eye out and uh, apply it as we feel the landscape could use, just to spruce it up again and give it a nice uh, add a color and aesthetically to make it look pleasing. Here is the uh, intersection at Broadway and Wilson. It is a large turf area, as you note, as you can notice, and it's also a bus stop on one of the corners, I believe, down south. Again, similarly, just south of the 134 over here, we. Uh, um, Existing turf removed. And what you notice on the left side here, it's not a very clear picture. You see a little tubing around the tree. That is what we call a soaker hose system. We're capping all of the sprinklers so we don't just spray water all over the place. And we're keeping the irrigation specifically to the trees, the mature trees, and or you know, the baby trees, we're by putting rounds of circles around them. And it will just dissipate water directly to the tree roots, the areas where the tree needs to grow, rather than watering the whole, all the areas. So very specific watering to conserve uh, water in this case. And you see the piles of mulch on the side. Once the uh, uh, soaker hoses have been installed, we just mulch it, and we have a you know, uh, final product there. So that will stay mulch? That'll, that is to stay mulch. As a matter of fact, in this site, highly likely we may come back with some drop tolerant planting. It is a large area for just mulch. Uh, even when we do plant, we will direct the irrigation specifically to the planted area so that we're not watering the whole area. Because the more we water, the more weeds we're going to start seeing come up. Even though we have a thick layer of mulch, it'll still be, uh, we'll still get some weed growth coming in. What, so do you do, what do you do for weed control when it comes to uh, we, we are looking at, uh, as a matter of fact, next couple of months we'll come back to you with a proposal for an integrated pest management program. Uh, we have hired, a, on an hourly basis, a licensed pest head applicator. It's, we use Roundup. Okay. Roundup to control it. What it is, though, is once you apply it, there's going to be you know, follow-up applications to have a true control on the weeds. So uh, we'll come back in the future to give you a presentation on an IPM program. Uh, for the park operations. Because I mean, parenthetically, like I see San Fernando, the plantings along there, weeds grow up there, so obviously Roundup is not being used in other locations. So is that something that can be extended to other 
We will be years. President Fouad, that is that is a, a very very good point you raised. Some of our contract sites, that is a contract maintenance site, contract landscape uh, uh, landscape landscape site. So we're working closely with our um, contractor to make sure the weed control stays at a, a higher level. Um, that is a site they only visit two times a month. Um, again, frequency the added frequency is going to add to the cost, so we've had it at a reasonably acceptable level of frequency at those sites. But when it comes to weeds, when we, found, when we find out there's weeds and overgrowth of them, we just inform the contractor to make it a priority. I mean, because so, mulch would be good there as well. You know? Mulch would be, and, and as a matter of fact, we had recommended to the contractor to look at, you know, applying mulch at that site, as well as a lot of their other uh, sites. Now, I'm glad you mentioned the contractor because as a result of all of these meetings being converted to mulch and or drop tolerant landscaping, we've met with the contractor a couple of times and we will have a sit down with the contractor in the near future to start discussing the scope of work at these sites. Not all of our meetings were uh, uh, turf. A lot of our meetings are just general landscape, drop tolerant or whatnot. However, the areas that are turf and we are converting either to mulch or a smaller scale drop tolerant landscape, we're hoping to gain from that in some cases as far as the reduction in cost. They don't have to mow every week and or they don't have to visit it uh, as frequently. So we'll sit down with the respective departments that manage those sites mm -hmm. along with them and the contract and identify likely a revised scope of work in some sites. In some cases, it may increase because to manage a planted drought turtle landscape versus turf, sometimes it could be more costly. So we're going to sit down and have evaluate each site and come up with a new revised scope of uh, plan for the contractor for most of our sites. Mountain Royal is another site that went from turf to mulch, and this is a site that we had a, a resident ask us to maybe utilize this site as a demonstration garden for drought tolerant plants. So once we planted this site, we're probably going to look at posting uh, maybe little placards that identify the plant, and the people walking their dogs in the area can look at it and you know mimic it for their gardens if they so choose. Another, this is the uh, right in front of the Shriners, Verdugo Road West. Went from mulch, again, you see the soaker hoses. And the reason why we put them so far away, the more mature the tree is, the farther away the fine roots are that require the water. So putting it abutting right next to the tree trunk doesn't do the tree any good at all. Hence, we have to phase it out as far as possible from the tree trunk to cover where the drip line is of the tree. That is where the farthest reaching uh, the branches would be. Now, are these also three times a week, the drip systems? The drip system, we could probably, most of the mature trees, we could reduce it down to either two times uh, per year or likely even once uh, per, per week, or likely even once per week. Given the fact that um, they're directly watering the fine roots, we may increase the time, but reduce it from being uh, three times a week down to likely once a week. And here's a picture of uh, the mulch. And again, we're working with our local tree contractors, tree vendors, to provide us the mulch free of charge. And sometimes, depending on the delivery, the project tends to shift by a day or two. But most of the mulch we have used so far have been free of charge thanks to our vendors, local vendors that we're working with. And this is the long stretch of Verdugo Road from Locker Center to Broadview. Again, same process was uh, implemented. Here's a picture of the turf. And now uh, the whole stretch is... Um, mulched. Again, this is another site we'll likely come back with some drop tolerant planting because it is a, a long stretch and we want to make sure we maintain it at an acceptable level of uh, landscape. Here is Monterey Road. This is one area where uh, the staff is working on today, uh, likely to be finished today or tomorrow by you know, application of DG. DG is decomposed granite and the reason why we're selecting DG is because of the school adjacent to it. And again, here's an example of the soaker hoses. Um, let me see if I have a better picture right here. Given that the tree is where the picture starts, facing all the way out, is what we want to make sure. It is a very large, mature tree. We want to make sure it sustains itself as we go forth. And likely within a couple of days, you would actually, if you drive by on Monterey, you should notice that that has been replaced with DG. Glorietta substation, similarly, taken turf out and put in gravel rock. Um, that was uh, one of the other Glenda water and power sites. Now, as far as what we have left in the medians, we still have a number of locations that we're working on, and uh, likely late June, early July, we'll have phase one completed. We have North Brand Boulevard from Colorado to Glen Oaks, uh, 18,000 square feet. Bouldry Drive is a long stretch of turf. There's about 22,585 square feet of turf there. Uh, 
Uh, Maryland Avenue is much smaller. Moncado Drive is very small. In Montrose Mall, there is about 3,394 square feet. Now, on Maryland and Montrose, those are scheduled to start on Monday next week. And we've worked, uh, we've met with uh, the uh, association at Montrose, and they've agreed that the ideal time for us to conduct that work, not to interfere with their operation, is at night, after they close. So for the week, for next week, a few of my project crews were shifting their schedule from day to night to be able to complete the job at Montrose Mall, as well as Maryland Avenue. Both areas are very active during the day, and with the heavy equipment they're going to use, it could get dusty and noisy. So uh, just to be good neighbors for our um, for those locations, we'll be conducting the work at night, likely to be completed at both sites uh, by the end of next week. Now, Brand Boulevard between Colorado and Glen Oaks is obviously a showcase area, so you're taking particular care in how that's going to look? We, we will be working with the uh, Downtown Glendale Association as to what they would think would be ideal landscape for this site. That's why North Brand Boulevard will likely be one of the latter uh, phases of the project. We've been in communication with them through our director and, and notifying them that this will be coming because it is an executive order. We have to comply, but we're also taking you know, a careful approach to make sure that it is a landscape that's acceptable and you know, aesthetically pleasing to the area given that it is downtown Glendale. And most of our other sites will be coming back with a, a landscape that you know, is very aesthetically pleasing. Um, but we are being very careful in some of the sites because of just the area that they are in and the careful consideration as to what kind of landscape is going to go in. As well as in the report, we highlight working closely with the association as to specific plant palette would be ideal for this site. So we have a total remaining square footage to be that is scheduled technically for 45,391. So total median turf removal will be about 98,000 square feet, not including the GWP sites. You get met, uh, met water rebate for this? We will be applying for the Metropolitan Water Rebate, even though uh, they would like for us to apply in advance and wait for the approval process. If you try to get on their site to get approval nowadays, it takes forever. Given that these are medians, we do not have the luxury of waiting. We have to comply with the executive order. We started the process, and we'll be working closely with Water and Power uh, staff to help us process the uh, paperwork for these sites, as well as some of the parks we're going to identify going forward. So yes, our goal is to uh, try and bank on every square foot of turf we've removed. Uh, and here is the list of the facilities and the turf. As you note, there is about 78,570 square feet of turf completed, including the GWP sites. The three sites, there may be more. These are the sites that we've assisted, and we have about close to 50,000 square feet left. Now, what else are we doing? The water play features, as you know, are very, very popular. I mean, you go any day of the summer, it is full of kids and families truly enjoying it. Our normal schedule used to be in past years from June 15 through October 15, and at, started at 11 a.m. and goes through 6 p.m. Uh, one of the ways we are looking at reducing a water consumption, because those two sites, they don't have the mechanism to capture the water and recycle it. Once the water is being played with, it just goes away, unfortunately. Um, so we're proposing... I designed or just it wasn't engineered that way? It was not engineered that way to begin with. Now, the future ones, uh, by mandate, by law, any future water play feature will be mandated to have a recycling system as part of it. Um, so at this point, for those two sites, we're proposing <coughs> that the schedule be revised starting June 15, which is today, through September 15. I mean, summer... The school starts actually in August nowadays, so that we kind of gain one month at that end. Um, the same time, it's still very warm through October. So we're proposing to maintain on a daily basis, June 15 through September 15, change the hours from 12 p.m. to 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. This reduces it by two hours per day. And as far as from September 15 through October 15, again, these sites being so popular for the kids to use, if anybody wishes to make a reservation for a kid's birthday party or whatnot on a Saturday, we'll work closely with them and, and Onyx operation to have them programmed for that specific reservation or for that day to, be, to allow the kids to continue to enjoy it through October 15. Um, that will still save us quite a bit of water for the remaining of the month. So this is one way we're hoping to gain on uh, water con consumption. And also, we've uh, working closely with our staff, we've identified a number of park facilities that can benefit from turf removal. Uh, in the report, 
some of the locations we had highlighted, those are just concepts and ideas of locations we think. There may be a more expanded list later on. So we're going to come back to commission following months, July and August, to give you the name of the facility, the area specifically, similar to what we did, show you an area, aerial location of the facility, give you the acreage that we're proposing to remove, and what we're looking at doing as far as the design, whether it's going to be drought tolerant, whether it be another recreation element that we can add in the mix. Um, and again, um, tentative schedule of work will also follow at that time. Uh, we're using our internal project management crews for these, so at times we have to pull them off to conduct other projects, but generally speaking, we'll be conducting most of the work using in-house staff. And lastly, I wanted to share this for our residents also. Uh, UC Davis uh, has a, a, an intensive list of drought tolerant landscape species they have done years and years of studies and identified for every region the types of ideal plants, low, use, low water use, moderate water use, high water use. So I wanted to post this. It is called WUCALS. It's Water Use Classification of Landscape Species. It is the fourth series of it. If you go to the UC Davis website, you can just type in WUCALS. It'll give you this website. And we're going to start looking at this site and the species that we're selecting to make sure, specifically for the Glendale area, there's about 1,600 species of drought tolerant or, or, or landscape, low water use landscape species that we could use. So whatever list we had made, we'll compare it to this and make sure it's, it's ideal for the site. Just want to post it here for anybody at home watching that would like uh, a resource. They could use this resource to conduct their landscape change at their residence. And for the time being, this is all that we have. Again, next month will be another extensive list of facilities and, and projects for the uh, parks, and we'll look for your feedback and guidance at that time. Any questions? Questions from anybody? I, I just have uh, with the, I think the uh, mulch would be okay, but if we do get the El Nino, <coughs> how will the decomposed granite, will we lose all that, or are we, it's hard to know. It, 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 and the Com rocks, the, the little rocks. Commissioner Sharkey, the little rocks actually will probably sustain themselves okay. quite well. Even with the DG... Um, you haven't used that much of it anyway. We, we so. won't be using that much in a lot of sites. And the, because it is not on a slope, it is more flat, it will sustain itself a bit more. And uh, as you know, most of them have the, the concrete sidewalk. What we've done is those areas, we've dropped it a little lower. Even with the mulch, those ends, we've dropped the uh, sand, the soil a little lower so that it actually is a bit lower and it'll hold itself in place. Thought of everything. <laughs> will, we have, will we have some mulch that might you know, fall off? It's, it's likely yeah. oh, possible. Of course, yeah. Will we have some DG that might you know, break up? Again, it's possible. There's no such thing as no maintenance. Whatever we put in will still require us to watch it closely and conduct some sort of, some level of maintenance. Uh, but again, the goal here being is to make sure we reduce our water consumption. Uh, in the immediate term, again, put in some mulch or DG or the rocks to sustain somewhat of an acceptable landscape and come back with a, a larger palette for each facility. Done an amazing job. <laughs> I cannot take the credit because the guys in the field are doing it. And, Done an uh, amazing job. <laughs> they do an amazing job. I, I, I do give them that. And I also want to thank uh, our weekend supervisor, Armin Tagakchan, to help me put together every site. Hey. You notice he had to do the measuring <laughs> to get specific uh, square footage. So I've asked him to come in and join us. He's hiding in the back. I know. Um, he has been a great help See in him. getting this uh, project together and some of this information together for you and for the public. I have a quick question. Um, Sir. You have mentioned that uh, the Montrose Mall, as mm -hmm. well as Maryland, because of the, uh, the popularity and the, the, the high volume usage throughout the day, you're going to be doing the work in the evening hours? Yes, sir. Um, well, you said the staff will be doing it, internal staff will be doing it, yes, and then sir. you're going to be altering their schedule. Yes, now, sir. when we have them work in the evening hours, do they work off of regular pay, or is it overtime, or how does that work? No. Uh, the, given the fact that we're shifting their schedule for that week, same number of hours, it will be regular time pay. Okay. And it'll be for the entire week. Hence, we kind of put the two projects together to have enough to do for the entire week to complete the project, whereas if they had worked three days to complete a job, if they worked that night, I would not be able to work in the following day because of fatigue, and we don't want anybody to get injured. So for the entire week, we'll have the project crew working at those two sites starting next Monday. Okay. Thank you. Mr. President, if I, had, if I may uh, add a few more uh, uh, points. Um, this is... Our phase one implementation plan, we wanted to give you as much details of exactly what we are doing as possible. You actually received a more detailed 
uh, report on all of our implementation actions than the City Council did. The City Council did approve our implementation of everything that they saw today at its meeting on April 28th. Um, as Mr. Coco, as Mr. Panosian alluded to, we will be coming back in July or, or August with details of, of phase two implementation, which is a further analysis, a v further evaluation and analysis of what more we can do in our parks, which areas in all of our parks lend themselves to uh, more drought tolerant uh, or turf removal and drought tolerant uh, plantings. Uh, so we'll provide you with, with a, a second list uh, so you can be totally on board with, with what we're doing and any impacts that you envision it might have on the community that maybe we might be overlooking. Um, so we do, want, we do want your feedback. We are under a state mandate. These are things that, that we have to do. These are, are all what's considered ornamental turf areas, which we are required to, to address. It's the few turf areas that the city has control over versus a private property. So we need to do everything that we can for uh, public properties. As Mr. Pinocchio also mentioned, we do have some work to do with our contractor to see where the offsets are and the trade-offs are for uh, having less turf for them to mow and, and blow where the savings are, but then where the additional costs are. Sometimes it's, uh, it, it is more time consuming to take care of, of plantings than it is just turf um, areas. Uh, so we're, we're working on that. Um, as So we do want your feedback. Uh, all of your questions are great questions. A lot of this is still relatively new to us as well in, in terms of of, of this massive of uh, uh, DG and, and mulch and uh, gravel in different places in terms of what the effects will be with, with the rains, especially if they're heavy rains. We are proposing to reduce the amount of time that the play features are available at two of our, our parks by one month. So we, we we're interested in your feedback on that. If, if you're okay with that in light of um, uh, trying to help deal uh, with the drought. Uh, so the city will begin to look different. The parks will begin to look a little different than what people are accustomed to. The, um, the merchant associations, we are working closely with them. Uh, we've we, we've uh, informed them exactly of what we were going to do, when we we're going to do it, and that's how we uh, determined that we needed to work in the evenings because we don't want to impose on them or um, we want to have a, a very limited impact on them and, and their businesses. Uh, we still have to uh, figure out the timeline for the um, North Brand uh, Parkways, for example. That's, that's our biggest project, and, uh, and we will do that. So we want to make sure we had a chance to run all of this by uh, you, the commissioners, and give you a chance to give us any feedback that you have uh, so that we can uh, incorporate that um, now and into phase, phase two. So. Well, I think you've done a fantastic job, and you've, you've answered, all my, answered or anticipated any question I had. Uh, I just met a, I don't know how often it comes up, but tr trees in commercial areas, street trees, mm -hmm. are they going to be affected? Are you not going to plant anymore? Are you going to, uh, maybe not all of them are irrigated, so maybe it doesn't matter. I, President Fouad, the street trees, uh, we'll, we'll work closely with our forestry department, which is under public works, our colleagues. They maintain the, the responsibility of the street trees, and I'm sure they have a plan for it now. Any turfed area that has trees, we're looking at modifying the irrigation to make sure we sustain the trees, uh, landscape uh, for the trees, specifically the irrigation modification. And for areas that, are n that, that do not have trees, we're not really restricted on the use of water other than the number of days. So they should be, they should be doing okay. Good. And you're not considering artificial turf other than ball fields? Uh, at this point, we are only considering artificial turf at our ball fields. Uh, because they're recreation, they add to the play as far as the, the sustainability. And just generally within the parks at this point, we have not considered it. And, and I do believe council is looking at an ordinance to allow the use of um, artificial turf in front lawns, residences, to sustain some green. And we'll, we'll see how, how that plays out. But as far as the parks go, at this time, the only areas we're considering artificial turf would be sport fields, specifically soccer fields. My two cents is don't put in artificial turf except ball fields, but, but I'm just a commissioner. <laughs> Duly noted. Uh, anything else? Thank you very much. Uh, next item. This is an action item. Um, if you, oh, I don't know if you have any feedback that you want to record or, say, so. or say that you're in agreement with the proposed. Oh, do we need to take an act? Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, what, do I hear a motion approving? What would be the 
Um, you well, can move that you are in agreement with the proposed changes or proposed plan. Do I have a motion are, uh, on agreeing with uh, the drought response plan as presented? I so move. Second. Second. Commissioners Kalfayan? Yes. Absent Sharkey? Yes. Wu? Yes. President Fwad? Yes. Thank you. Next item then. 6B, 2016 Rose Float Design and Name. At one is a motion to review and approve the Rose Float Committee's recommendation. Getting there is half the fun. As the proposed Rose Float concept design and float name for the 2016 Pasadena Tournament of Roses Parade and recommend it to City Council for final approval. President Fwad, members of the commission, before you <laughs> is a report on the proposed concept plan for our 2016 Rose Float. The last float entry the city had was in 2014 with Let's Be Neighbors, where the uh, float won the Governor's Trophy Award for Best Depiction of Life in California and the KTLA Viewer's Choice Award in 2014. Uh, the city did not have a float in 2015. Um, we didn't participate in the, in the parade. Our staff was not able to secure sponsorship for the float and the city did have higher priorities and was not able to appropriate funds for a 2015 float. With um, the 2015 parade coming by, the, uh, some residents in the community were um, missing the float and decided to form a, uh, the, a new Glendale Rose Float uh, Association. So with the absence, the residents um, joined together and are in the process of incorporating the Glendale Roseville Association. They're in the process of submitting the 501c3 uh, paperwork. But in working with the city, uh, we submitted a application to the tournament for a $125,000 uh, float for this year. The tournament uh, accepted the city's condition, uh, uh, the city's application with the condition that the city submit a $200,000 float because they are looking to, to produce a parade of exceptional quality. So they wanted their floats to, to be bigger and better. Um, on May 5th, the city council appropriated $200,000 for the 2016 float with direction that the Glendale Rose Float Association will raise enough money to at least offset $50,000 of the cost. The 2016 theme for the parade is Find Your Adventure, and it grew out of a partnership um, between the Pasadena Tournament of Roses and the U.S. National Park Services. Uh, staff worked with the um, Rose Float Association in identifying some potential designs for the float. And uh, the Rose Float Association held public meetings and gathered input and ideas on float themes and, and ideas, which were shared with, um, with Phoenix Decorating. The Rose Float Committee, um, which is made up of staff and the Rose Float Association, reviewed numerous potential designs um, and themes and uh, working closely with Phoenix to develop a design that best represents the parade theme, Find Your Adventure, and the city of Glendale. The concept and the theme name that is, um, the, the float name that is recommended is getting there is half the fun. Uh, the, it, you should see the design in your packet and it should be, oh, there it is. Um, we can all be reminded that the experience of getting there, wherever there may be, is really half the fun and to enjoy our journey, whether it involves traveling by various modes of transportation, and as you could see in the design, we have a, a locomotive, an airplane, a car, bicycle, um, and to en enjoy the journey, whether it involves, uh, again, traveling by various modes of transportation, going through change, whether it's educational, um, career, social life, or the city through all the various changes that we've seen in, in the past few, few years, uh, or exploring the outdoors, you know, hiking, biking, and all the recreational activities that we provide in our department in, in within just our department and our city. The float, float design uh, depicts the historical transportation building in the background um, with uh, various modes of transportation and Glendale landmarks identified in the arches of a bridge structure beneath the um, locomotive. You could see the Alex Theater and, and the Brand, Brand Library. Representing one of one's history, fun journey to the present, and gateway to unlimited future adventures and change. The Glendale City Board, the Peacock, is uh, leading the way with the city's um, 
logo the swirls represented on its tail. As uh, Glendale is a leader in historic preservation and innovation and is becoming a destination place for uh, fun and adventure. The float size this year is 55 feet long, uh, 25 feet high, and 15 feet wide. Uh, there will be some animation on the train, uh, on the float with the train wheels um, and the air, airplane propellers spinning as the float goes down, um, uh, down the road in Pasadena. And it will accommodate 10 riders. The ridership will be determined by the Glendale Rose Float Association based on sponsorships, major donors, and um, some sort of a, a raffle, a crowdfunding fundraising efforts. So the Rosefoot Association will determine exactly how those riderships are divided. Um, the, a report will be going before City Council tomorrow for approval of the design and uh, the float name. And before you today is a report to approve and recommend approval to City Council. Concludes my report if you have any specific questions. Questions? I have a comment. <laughs> Comments. So, well, I, I really do like uh, getting there is half the fun. That's great. I love our historic train station, our bikes, everything. But when I first looked at it, I thought, what is the NBC Peacock doing on our float? <laughs> and immediately said Burbank, even though they've moved. Uh, but then when you brought up that it does have our little circles on the... So my question is, how large is that peacock? Is that the most overwhelming part. And what's it even doing there in the first place? Well, I sorry. It's, it's, how does it's traveling a, relate to peacocks? <laughs> well, I did that too. <laughs> I, I did think of that. I thought <clears throat> peacocks don't even move very fast. <laughs> I, I even thought, you know, being a parks person, one of our trails with runners, but um, no, but it's, anyway, I just, my question is how large is this NBC peacock? <laughs> um, a Commissioner uh, Sharkey, President Park, know, Commissioner yeah. Sharkey, I don't have exact dimensions on the peacock, um, but it is something we could address uh, with with Phoenix to find out the exact dimensions. But at this time, I don't have uh, the exact size of the peacock, and um, the reason the peacock it's because of it being the city's bird and yeah. being on our seal. I was glad that was in the report. It's I the said, bird? "Yes, it's in the report." I read, "Why is there a peacock?" And it says it's the city's bird, and I thought, who knew? <laughs> I hope we don't have a fish, do we? <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to micro-design things, but depending on the size, it seems a little weird, and there's I mean, so many other things you could put. Like, I love to run on a, yeah, on a the, treadmill. Our trail runs, yeah. So many things you could put there in the most prominent place. I had a sort of general uh, question. By not being in 2015 uh, parade, yeah. did we lose any sort of priority? Or is, is there a priority, or is there anything we sort of lost by sitting out of here? President Fouad, we, we normally, um, every year we do get invited back. So if we participate this year, next year we do get invited back. Uh, so you do get priority if you are um, in the parade for the following year. And I think this year um, we were considered a new applicant because we, were, uh, we missed out last year. So technically the city was considered to be a new applicant. And we, we were evaluated just like everybody else. And... Uh, I guess you could say that we did get a little bit of priority, being that we do have history with the parade, and we, which is why we were invited to come back with the condition that we can offer a $200,000 float, because that's the range of floats that were offered uh, by other new applicants. Oh, so the 200 k was a condition of the Rose Parade, not, not something we wanted to do. Right. It was a part of the, the Tournament of Roses put that condition um, on the acceptance of the city's application. Because they have many more people who want to be in the Rose Parade than Spallants. Correct. Okay. Yes, President Fodd, if, if, if I may add, um, we, we were treated like a new applicant, uh, but at the same time we were given preference because we, we had been in the parade for 100 consecutive year, years. Uh, but because we were treated by a new applicant, uh, the Tournament of Roses was able to condition the acceptance of our application on a promise that we would uh, have a, uh, a guaranteed quality float and determine that a $200,000 valued uh, float would be a quality float. Uh, and we were given preferential treatment because we were in, invited back. Um, and our understanding was that there was a lot of, a lot of competition, that they had received a, a greater 
amount of applications than they normally do and, and had to turn away quite a number of uh, applications, but, but we were accepted. Uh, we, when we give our report to City Council, we, can, we will indicate that part of the Commission's feedback was that if you look at the scale of the Peacock, it, it does look large and there may be some consideration be given to uh, reducing its size and or some consideration be given to potentially replacing the Peacock with some sort of uh, out, outdoor park theme or, or, or something different. Um, and then we'll see what the Council's um, uh, feedback is uh, themselves and to what extent they want to take into consideration or agree with the Commission's feedback. So if and when you do pass the motion, it, it could be um, as, as presented um, with the request that consideration be given to those two items, if that's what you would like to do. That's, that's good feedback. <clears throat> what kind of category would be entered in? Uh, like they have different categories, like smaller floats, larger floats. Uh, where, where are we in this one? Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Off? I'm not sure about the categories. They have um, uh, a category of of cities with floats, and then I, I think it's basically just yeah, cities and, and, and business. Smaller and larger ones. It's like uh, I think they distinguish them somehow. Somehow, when they give the profit, trophies, especially. Commissioner Kalfayan, mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, at, at this stage, and even in previous years, we haven't determined what categories the float would would um, be entered into the parade as, and I think it, depending on what we end up with the float, it falls under the specific categories, but at this time, I don't have specifics on um, whether the, those are determined at this stage or if it's as they come to do the judging, if they determine where it would uh, fall best based on the various uh, judging categories. With how much did we uh, spend in previous years? Like, I don't think we went up to $200,000. Uh, um, President Fahd, Commissioner uh, Hufayan, two years ago, the last time we had a float, that float was valued at $150,000, and that was the meatball, the bear float. Um, two years, for two consecutive years prior to that, which is the time that I've been in the department, it was a $100,000 float. Um, those were 30-foot floats or 35 feet long. Uh, this one is proposed to be 55 feet, so it's, it, it'll be much, much bigger. Uh, the other idea is that um, we always included in our, our contract with Phoenix Decorating is our ability to tow our float back to Glendale to exhibit it on Brown Boulevard for a couple of days. And then Phoenix will come and pick it up from Glendale and take it back to there warehouse in order for the chassis to be re reused for the, um, the float in the ensuing year. So it will be a much larger float than what we are accustomed to. And that's, that's why we have the ability to have a number of um, um, icons will, which will exhibit people on the move and Glendale on the move and, and experience, experiencing our adventure through our different modes of transportation and uh, throwing in some of the icons of, of our city. So. That's what it's supposed to represent. Well, I would. Uh, do you have? I, yes, I would uh, go ahead. I, uh, the, the icon being the peacock. Um, go ahead. Can you give me some clarification as to uh, in the background it says uh, the GRFA is hoping to offset about fifty thousand. In the fiscal impact, it says it's trying to raise up to one hundred fifty thousand in two thousand fifteen. So. Um, sure. Uh, President Fawad, uh, Commissioner Wu, the, when Council approved the $200,000 as part of the city's budget for the float, the direction was for the association to be able to offset at least 50000 of it. And again, depending on how much money they're able to raise this year and in the years going forth, the association's goal is to be able to fully fund it in future years. And so this year, they are hoping to at least um, profit 150000 based on their fundraising. But council's direction was that at least a minimum of 50000 would be raised by the association. So if they are able to raise more, um, they can use those funds to offset next year's float. So they would fully fund next year's float versus look to the city to be able to appropriate more money for the 2017 float or be able to, um, and, and I think that's what the goal would be, is for them to be able to uh, use those funds to offset next year's float or be able to um, 
enter a float for next year on behalf of the city. But the council's direction was at least for them to be able to raise 50,000. So for the upcoming 2016 float, the city's appropriate 150,000? Fully, we've, uh, the city has appropriated 200,000 and are hoping to uh, be offset by 50,000. So out of pocket, the city would be um, using 150,000. But at this point, the city did um, fund the 200,000. Well, do I hear a motion? I move it. Uh... Second. I, I would like to, with, with, the, with our right. comments on the bird. Just for clarification, was it to either make it smaller or remove it, or? Well, I don't think we want to micro design it, but yeah. do something. I mean, I, some of us. I mean, it's personally, I like to remove it, but but something a little more than just a peacock. Yeah. Nobody, no, I didn't just know it was a Glendale bird just till this moment. <laughs> Not sure anybody cares, to be honest. Jess, help us. <laughs> um. So it's. It's a, it would be a motion to approve the design with consideration being given to the, the size of the peacock or, or a different uh, structure at the front. Or the, replacing the peacock with another or replacing symbol, the peacock. such as a runner. A trail runner. A trail or a hiker. Runner, for instance. Yeah. Commissioner is Kalfayan? Yes. On is absent. Sharkey? Yes. Wu? Yes. President Fwad? Yes. Uh, next item, please. Item 7, reports for information only at A is a Fremont Park Tennis Concession update. Oral report. Good afternoon, President Fodd and members of the commission. I'm Gabrielle Golia, and I'm the supervisor of the sports section. Um, on July 7th of 2014, the city issued a request for proposals soliciting interested parties to bid on the concession operations at Fremont Tennis Courts. Um, on August 29th, that RFP closed, and six proposals were received um, for the operations. The city selected the Glendale Tennis Academy, and the Glendale City Council adopted a motion on January 13th, 2015, to award a contract to the Glendale Tennis Academy um, for the operation of Fremont Tennis Courts. Um, the courts have been closed or were closed from March 1st through May 31st for some repairs and uh, improvements on the lighting. Uh, we got new lights um, and then we also resurfaced the courts, including changing the colors to the um, blue and green of the U.S. Open courts. So they're very, they're very light and pretty right now and, and everybody is really happy with the color of them. They're, um, they look very good. Uh, and that was at the request of the new contractor. They came in and asked if, if we would be able to change the colors to the U.S. Open. Um, on June 1st, uh, the Glendale Tennis Academy opened Fremont Tennis Courts back up to the public. Um, they are currently open. They are open daily from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, the fees are $5 per court per hour from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. weekdays and $7 per court per hour from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. weekdays and all day on the weekends. Group classes are available from $15 to $25 uh, per hour, and that's taught by the concessionaire, and it's just dependent on the size of the group. Um, other classes are available from private renters. Uh, those prices are set by the instructors. This is when someone comes in and rents a court in order to teach their own private lessons. So we don't dictate those prices or have any um, impact on those prices. They're set by whoever is renting those courts. And the contractor is working with some of their regular users who come daily in order to provide a price break. So um, for instance, they are charging the rate of $20 per month per participant for a group of regular users. Um, there's a, a group of four to six seniors who come three days a week for a couple of hours per day. So instead of paying the daily rate, they're only paying $20 per month per person. And that is representing about a 50% price break for them. The contractor is offering drop-by play, reserved courts, group classes, private instruction, and camps at the courts. And if anybody is interested in renting the courts, they can call 818-241-6022 or visit their website at www.glendale-tennis.com. Uh, thank you. Any questions or comments? Um, uh, President Fox, just... 
Just to add, uh, there are eight tennis courts at Fremont, which represents probably 25% of the total number we have in, in the city of Glendale. So it was a significant inconvenience to the community, while well, the tennis playing community in the Glendale, so we apologize again for that inconvenience. So needless to say, there was a lot of anticipation for us to get these courts back online. So they're finally back online. We have a new concessionaire, and so we are excited and hopeful that uh, the tennis community is back on track. What happened to the pickleball? Uh... Pickleball is being offered at Pacific Community Center. Not at the Fremont? Uh... No. Uh, mem President of Ford, members of the commission, we currently have pickleball at Pacific, um, Mondays and Thursdays between f 5 and 9, and uh, every day open play. Um, but pickleball, I know that uh, there was some uh, talk of, um, during one of the Fremont master planning meetings, um, having a court there. So we're uh, working with our uh, public work section and our uh, design, uh, conceptual designer on uh, adding courts at Fremont. But with the current existing courts, there are no pickleball courts now. Thank you. Um, anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Item 7B, Adult Recreation Center and Senior Programs Annual Report. Hello, good afternoon, President Huat and Commissioners. Okay, so I decided to do something a little bit different today. Um, when I walked into the facility this morning, uh, it kind of dawned on me that we've, we've gone over all of this. You've seen the pictures. We, we know what programs we have. But I wanted you to kind of follow me with what a sense of walking into the building at 9 o'clock in the morning is. Um, I do get there at 8, but that, I was just saying at 9, that's when it starts kicking. Has everybody been to the Adult Recreation Center? Okay, so um, I think I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Julianne Leviant. I'm the uh, supervisor of the Adult Recreation Center. So when I walked in this morning, I noticed the rotunda just packed with people. Down the hallway in the activity room, we have our lip reading class that we, that we coordinate with uh, Glendale Community College. In multi-purpose A, uh, multi-purpose room A to your right, we had people already packed at the tables with their domino board or, or their dominoes, their backgammon boards, and their cards. In in multi-purpose room B, we were already set up for bingo. So then we go out into the upper courtyard, and there's already people enjoying their coffee. Down in the lower courtyard, the ones who weren't able to get into the room are now down in the lower courtyard playing backgammon dominoes, cards, and then um, over to the front desk, there's a long line for the lunch program where we have um, to turn over that after our two exercise classes in the morning. So from 8 to 9 and 9 to 10, we have two different exercises. Staff goes in there, sets up, and then we open for lunch at 1030. So while all this is happening, people are milling around, kind of going from place to place, not to mention our gym, which people go in there and, and work out. It's, it's packed in the morning. And then our billiards room, which is always packed. <laughs> so it's, it's just a constant movement. And then everybody's moving to different things, too. They'll work out, do billiards, do exercise, and then um, go over and, and do other classes also. So once bingo's done, then we open it back up for open play because there is a demand for that. So also today on the lower courtyard, we worked with one of our, uh, we collaborate with Path Ventures. So they were down there in the part of the lower courtyard sharing it with the rest of the seniors. And then today we're going to have Easter Seals come in and use one of the rooms for their after school program. So it's just, um, and then of course after lunch we have uh, table tennis where we set up six table tennis uh, tables and they come in for drop-in table tennis. So this is just one day. And then every day is different. We'll have karaoke, we'll have bridge, we'll have, I mean, it's just ongoing. So I just, it's a, it's a little bit different from just, you know, flipping through and kind of showing you, you know, pictures that we've seen, the dining hall. Um, I just wanted to give you an idea of what it's like during the day when you walk in, so. Um, 
we do still have all the lunch programs, so every time we have um, some sort of celebration, um, for example, Thursday we're having our Father's Day celebration, and one of the um, the presenters that comes in, it's a uh, AGA, and I'm sorry, I, I, the name escapes me. They're sponsoring balloon artists, and we thought the balloon artists would be fun for Father's Day for the seniors. We have three balloon artists coming in, and that's no cost to us. So they get to go around the facility and make balloon animals, and then we're also going to have games um, for Father's Day, and then, of course, Fourth of July would be our next celebration, too. So we have... Uh, a variety of activities that I've mentioned, and uh, the senior mixer, which is about 100 people every Thursday, and that's just a, a dance that you can see in the, the lower left. So, um, and those are the ping pong tables that we set up on one side, and then on the other side is the same setup of three ping pong tables. So we, we offer legal assistance through, um, through places we collaborate with, like, that Zedek, and um, anything that we can do to, to refer, we use our case managers to refer them to anywhere else, Dee Dee Hirsch. And um, we do beeline pass sales, Metro tap card reloading, um, and then health screenings and then informational presentations. So with our health screenings, we did have a, kind of an impromptu health fair in May. And so hopefully we can start doing this every year. And we had uh, Glendale Memorial, Glendale Adventist. We had a lot of people that we work with during the year just come out for free and, and, and offer things to the seniors, uh, free items or free health screenings. And so, I mean, the, the way that I kind of went about it, I just wanted to, to make it a little bit more real rather than just looking at the pictures. We still work with Glendale Community College at all, th at, um, all three sites at Spar Heights, Pacific, and uh, Adult Recreation Center. And then some of our collaborations, so. Your morning said it all. <laughs> well, I know. <laughs> that was a good idea. Uh, thank you. No, that was very informative, and I appreciate the format. Okay, great. Thank you. I have a question. Though. Yes. Your, your mic's off. I, or, okay, no, it's on. Uh, you have exercise group uh, classes, and it's crowded and so on. Do you need more space, or you have enough yes, space? Yes, please. Do you, you have any more space sure. for me? <laughs> My other question is, uh, uh, do we have shower rooms in there? Since, no. No, we don't. <laughs> yes, please, on that one, too. Okay. <laughs> So if you're going to keep offering, I'm going to keep saying yes. So, <laughs> so yes. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? Well, thank you very much. You're Appreciate welcome. It. Thank you. Uh, President Fowd, members of the commission, I, I do have one more comment related to the ARC. As part of our work plan for f fiscal year 15-16 is to initiate uh, a master planning process for Central Park. And part of that, we will look at the Adult Recreation Center and see if there's an opportunity to uh, expand the Adult Recreation Center if, if, if you and the City Council agree that, that that's, that's warranted. So we'll take a look at that. It is, is, there, is there's room for it? Uh, there, there may be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ominous, but good. Mm -hmm. She's happy. Yes, She's, she's <laughs> happy. <laughs> uh, thank you. Item 7C is Senior Services Annual Report. Good afternoon, President Flawed, Commissioners and staff. I'm Maggie Kavarian, Community Services Supervisor with the Senior Services Unit. Today I'm going to introduce our case managers to you to present the PowerPoint presentation because they are our frontline employees. They are the ones that go into the homes. They are the ones that deal with our clients and they can give you a very broad picture of what happens. So I'd like to introduce John Magogian, Community Services Com Coordinator, and Eileen Asayan, Community Services Coordinator. Good afternoon. Do I have the thing? Uh, John Magogian, President of Fawad, members of the commission. I am the senior case manager at the Adult Recreation Center. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do there. Um, senior service, Maggie, you want me to cover the first point, yeah? Uh, over 85 unduplicated seniors uh, receive case management services. Over 110 seniors request information. Case managers provide seniors with over 8,000 bus tokens and 650 taxi vouchers annually. 
Over 40,000 congregate, congregate meals are served annually, excuse me. Over 13,000 home delivered meals, over 2,000 telephone reassurance calls are made annually. The city of Glendale is the only agency in the county that offers senior serves, seniors the opportunity to eat a hot meal seven days a week. Um, so what I do specifically is supportive services, um, that's case management. So we assist seniors with uh, hoarding issues, transportation, nutrition, uh, caregiver support, utility assistance, benefits, which is like Medi-Cal, Medicare, whatever the case may be. We work closely with the police department, so we go to their roll calls. The fire department calls us out anytime there's an emergency where there's a senior that needs any specific care whatsoever, we go and we attend to them as well as we can. We help with uh, Alzheimer's Association groups, uh, finding them people to talk to. Uh, a lot of the time we'll get phone calls from property managers, landlords, whatever the case may be. Um, I put a few pictures in here of, of kind of what I've walked into a few times. Uh, as you can see here, this is a, actually one specific room at the YMCA. They have the, the dormitory side of their building. And we had a senior that was just really hoarding. It was very dangerous. He was smoking in there. And we were able to go in with a cleaning crew. And I know it doesn't look perfect, but you couldn't even see the floor when I walked in. So just wanted to give you an idea of some of, some of the uh, situations we walk into. Um, I also coordinate the Thanksgiving food drive. And the city of Glendale staff uh, did a great job this year of, of donating cans. Um, and we actually got the library to give us some books this year. So that way they can get, they had something to read. And they're, they're very thankful. Um, so we were able to push out a little over 120 bags. And a lot of the time, those, those bags, they last a little bit longer than you think. So I'll have seniors that'll come to me in December, January, still looking for canned food. So uh, maybe it's something we can look into a little further going down the line and seeing if we can extend it and continue to, to gather cans. We don't want to have it be a, like the Salvation Army, like a pantry, but at the same time, there, there's definitely a need to, to provide them some support when it comes to nutrition. Um, and some additional pictures as well. The bags were well decorated, so what they would do is they would decorate stuff, we would go pick up, and then once we got it all collected at the end of the, uh, towards the end of the middle, third week of November, we started pushing all that. We, we would give them out to the home, homebound seniors first, and then whatever was left over, we'd share with people in the building, and um, some of our homeless clients would come by too, so we tried to share with them. Um, next, I'm gonna pass it over to Eileen. Thank you. Good afternoon, President uh, Fouad and Commission and staff. My name is Irina Sayan. I'm here to present the nutrition programs. The first one being the Home Delivered Meals Program. Um, this program is geared for those who are homebound and unable to attend any of our centers to have a meal. So they have to be 60 years or older, homebound, live in Glendale, La Crescenta, and Montrose. We deliver once a week, which includes seven frozen meals, uh, milk, bread, and fresh fruits. And this is what um, a meal looks like if they were to do exactly for each day. So this is uh, Swedish meatballs, noodles, and juice, and all of that goes with one pack. Um, these are some of the pictures of our clients who are on the program right now. This is our Santa to Senior 2014. Every year we collaborate with Burbank Home Instead and we give them a, a wish list of what our clients would like and they tri uh, try to provide at least one item. So this is um, our meals driver, Vlad. And he dressed as, as a you know, Santa Claus and um, passed out the presents for our clients. Um, this year, the county gave us uh, some funding for emergency meals, so we were able to provide our seniors with emergency meals just in case of an earthquake or a disaster. Uh, we just, it's six meals, so we passed them out. We just finished passing them out this week. Uh, March for Meals 2015 Proclamation and Older Americans Month was um, the theme was Get Into the Act. And on the left is Vlad accepting the proclamation, and on the right is Irma, who was also the Volunteer of the Year this year. Um, for the first time this year, the Meals Program coordinators um, did the 90 plus birthday celebration, which we celebrate all our 90 plus participants in our meals programs. And here are some pictures. With their families, we had about 200 people show up with their families and their caregivers. And for Older American Month, uh, for Older American Month, uh, the mayor went out to visit one of our um, uh, clients. Her name is Madeline Salibian, and she's actually an Armenian genocide survivor. So it happened in, in, in the same month as the 100th um, centennial 
Wasn't that in the news press, that story? Um, I believe it might have been, but yeah. I, she had gone to another event also. So. I mean, with the mayor going? I believe yeah. so, yes. This is our congregated meals program. We have three different sites where we serve uh, meals. The first, time, uh, first one being Adult Recreation Center. We uh, serve seven days a week, and each day we have roughly about 100 individuals that show up to eat. Um, Spar Heights Community Center, we serve Monday through Friday, um, and average is about 45 to 50 individuals. And this is Pacific Community Center, we only do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and it's roughly about 20 individuals that show up to eat. And this is what a complete meal looks like. That's it. Any other questions? I have a quick question. Sure. Um, can you tell me as to what the hours of, uh, like for instance, what hours are for breakfast? The, okay. So if I could go ahead and bring, are you guys in need of any volunteers, by the way? We are always accepting volunteers for uh, any of our meals program. They just have to contact the coordinator or just uh, Parks Department, and we can direct them to the appropriate person. Okay, so what are the hours for, like, breakfast on a Saturday or a Sunday so we can try to um, we don't serve breakfast our meal starts at 11:30 so the cl uh, the volunteers need to be there around 10 to set up and to get everything ready for the clients that's uh, so only lunch correct 11:30 mm -hmm. thank you but we do have weekends they can if they'd like to volunteer for the weekends that's something that they can do okay on the weekends what are the hours that they can um, same thing 11:30 to 12:30 for Saturdays um, and Sundays, 11, same time, 11.30 to about 12.30. It would need to be there by 10? Correct. And to set up and get everything out. And they'll be there to about, about 1? Roughly around 1 after cleanup. Thank you. Mm -hmm, sure. Any other questions? Oh. Is the food catered or you cook it at the spot? Uh, we do have a cook on site, but the company we work with, the catering company is Morrison, and they, ha they have their own cook at our center, which is at the Adult Recreation Center, and then the meals for SPAR and Pacific get transferred. And how do you find about older people that you go to their, visit their houses? How do you find out about them? Those are referrals from the hospitals, from the police department, some of the uh, home visits that they do, um, different organizations that we collaborate with. So it's they contact us through um, uh, um, the senior homes, everything. We, we get we get a lot of referrals from PD. So we do their roll calls a lot of the time. Um, I've gotten a lot of phone calls from the fire department. Uh, it depends on what they walk into. But a lot of the time, it's, it's uh, an adult child that's calling us worried about their you know, parent that's that maybe they're out of state. So a lot of our referrals can come from so many different places. When it comes to case management, though, um, I, I, it's broad. It, it, it ranges from a lot of different areas. Yeah. Uh, for example, you mentioned YMCA. How did you find out the room was uh, that I'll way? get a call from the YMCA supervisor saying we need your help. We have a senior that's not letting us in. or we haven't. What they do there is they do bed checks, so they normally change their sheets for them. Mm -hmm. So if he keeps in, you know, constantly saying he doesn't want it, um, they'll alert someone, and then I'll go in and see what's going on. And, and they're reluctant to let anyone in. A lot of the time, they know if, if I walk in, it's a possibility of them losing independence in some way or another with me saying, hey, have you considered assisted living, or maybe this, there's some safer ways to go about what you're doing, especially if they're smoking indoors. And we're, we're talking about this, the room is the size of a box almost, you know, it's like a small office. I don't know if you guys have been in the dormitories over there, but they're very small. So you want to keep it safe. You don't want any electrical cords running under sheets and things of that nature. But when you hoard, that builds up. And so you're not aware of if it's a piece of paper, if it's cardboard, whatever the case is in front of you. So the first objective is to, to make sure it's safe. So the fire department will also join me. And I'll call, I call a police officer. I'll call, I'll call Officer Shine. I'll call whoever I need to. And they're always willing to come in, and, and we... We'll work it out together. I'll call Adult Protective Services. You always want to have an extra set of eyes see what you're seeing before you make a, you know, any kind of drastic move that's going to affect their lifestyle. Because you want, to, you want to provide them independence first before you start adjusting how they live every day. Do you deliver food for them also? That's uh, what Eileen does. That's when, I'll go in and do, that's when I'll go in and do the paperwork and see if they qualify. And from there, we start the meals program on a temporary basis. What makes them to qualify? 60 years or older, homebound, and unable to go near the centers to have an actual meal. So for someone in his case, he was actually able to come down to the center and have a meal. And he's been a participant for almost since the beginning of the 
case. Yeah, we collaborate well together. I mean, it, it, it could, it could, she could get the first call or I could get the mm -hmm. first call, but either way, right away we'll work together. We'll go over, if we need to go over together and, you know, collaborate, we will. Do we get a lot of uh, walk-ins from the YMCA to the uh, not, meal, meal programs uh, during the lunch? Uh, yes, we do. We, we do. do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they are all low-income. Uh, and we're I, close by. It's right yeah, down it's the street. It's very convenient for them, yeah. Well, if a person is able-bodied, are they, can they be homebound, or is it like if you, and they don't have a car, say, but they're able-bodied, are they, what are they considered? In that case, we'll set them up with dial -ride or access, and they can transport, because dial -ride will bring them down to any of the centers to have an actual meal without a fee. But if, um, yeah, access or dial -ride would pick them up and take them and bring them back. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we, um, we do have a taxi voucher bus token program that we've, we've been able to grow. Uh, we get double the amount of tokens that we used to get, and we cater to more seniors than ever before. So I'm able to give them 20 bus tokens, which is potentially $1.50 each time they ride the bus. That's going to save them plenty of money in the long run. So we, we go out of our way to, to provide them as many resources as we can. That rides aren't just to come to the meals. That's just for the No, family. no, no. We want them to get the doctor's appointments, grocery store, whatever, whatever the case may be. I get a lot of requests. I mean, there's also caretaking involved, and we're, we're supporting them with a lot of different things as well. So whether it's Medi-Cal and in-home supportive services, um, in-home care, uh, we have a very small grant that we use to provide them, whether it's a home cleaning or I go in a situation like that and it needs to get gutted, which means you take everything out and you kind of start over. You got to paint the walls and take the carpets out. We'll do whatever we need to do. And we'll, we'll collaborate with whoever we need to, whether it's neighborhood services, GYA, whoever we can call in, we will. And everyone's really good about working together, which is the best part. What kind of annual budget do we have to work with? Annually? For the meals program or for the for, uh, for community the, service? That would be Maggie Kavarian. <laughs> we, we, have a grant, we have grant funding from Los Angeles County. We have uh, funding through our city funds. We have um, a CDBG fund this year. So we have a, collaborate, uh, a numerous amount of funding. But the main funding comes from Los Angeles County. So how much is that? It's about two hundred. The, the, the whole thing for the elderly nutritional meals program. It's a little over two hundred and twenty-five thousand per year. For the supportive services program, which is the case management program, it's fifty thousand dollars a year. And that's sufficient. EBG. That's sufficient for. Definitely. Does that include your salaries, or that's just the? We are paid out of the one hundred and one, the general fund. Uh, President Foud, um, we do have the fiscal impact in your staff report, and according to the, re the report, the program's annual cost is about $439,000. That pays for the maintenance and operation of the program, staff salaries, and that would include the, um, yeah, the case management program and the, all the meals programs. So it's about a $440,000 operation. And your CDBG was two thousand seventy-five thousand. Uh, Our CG, CDBG funding this year was sixteen thousand. Sixteen thousand. Correct. It's gone down or up? Uh, it has actually gone down over the years. It started up at twenty-two thousand, and it's kind of trickled down to sixteen. Why is it? Why did it go down? It, it's just competitive funds. It's just a uh, CDBG has gone down as well. I mean, they haven't been funding. HUD hasn't been fun, funding us as well, so. They just have to figure out a new solution to fund everyone with whatever funding they have. Uh, anything else? Well, thank you very much. We're a very worthwhile program. Next. The next item is 7D Maple Park Community Center Annual Report. Good afternoon, President Fudd, members of commission. My name is Kenneth Kahn. I supervise Maple Park Community Center. Um, just here to give you a brief overview of uh, Maple Park Community Center. Coming. Okay. <laughs> um, Maple Park services the residents of South Glendale and the surrounding areas. The center uh, underwent a large-scale renovation in the um, summer of 2010, reopened in the summer of 2011. Uh, since the reopening, Maple Park uh, has become one of the department's key revenue producers, with the center providing um, <coughs> residents a revenue to, uh, I'm sorry, a venue to um, 
host birthday parties, weddings, christenings, baby showers, and so forth. Um, Maple Park also has many drop-in activities open to the general public. There's a basketball court, a volleyball um, set up, as well as a computer lab and recreation room. Um, there's also other programs. We're going to get into a slideshow here. Well, actually, this is the renovated building that renovated in 2011. Um, so the indoor facilities that we have, um, the full court gymnasium, which is equipped with a kitchenette, we do do large um, events and rentals in the gymnasium that can hold up to 200 people. Um, there's also two meeting rooms downstairs that we rent out as well. Um, in addition to that, like I mentioned, there's a computer lab and a recreation room. This is the picture of our gym. It's very busy now for the summer drop-in as the kids are out of school. It's our computer lab, which is very um, well utilized. A lot of residents use the computer lab that don't have computer or internet access at home. Um, so we have activity cards, you know, $25 for the whole year or $2 per the day. Um, a lot of residents come in and they access the computer lab, the programs, and so forth. This is our meeting room. We also hold a Club Maple program in this room. Um, it's a very popular room. Our recreation room for the kids where we do a lot of drop-in activities and just kind of give the kids a place to go after school, so it's very popular. This is the large uh, wedding that we did. Yes, this is Maple Park, not the Sheraton. Um, so, you know, we do do lots of events now um, at Maple Park. It's a good venue for people looking to do a grand event on a budget. And um, I always tell the customer it's just how you decorate it. You know what I mean? Because it's, as you see from the pictures, you know, it looks um, amazing. This is the meeting room. This was a Sweet 16 that we did. Um, so, like I said, another good venue that we offer the residents of South Glendale and the surrounding areas. This is a chess tournament that we did. Um, we do this four times a year um, with American Chess Academy. Very popular program. We have close to 200 kids um, that come four times a year every season, and um, it's just getting bigger and bigger. Um, we do also have out outdoor facilities, recent renovation that took place. Um, there's a full-size tennis court, walking paths. Um, we do have fields that we use you know, for outdoor play. Um, there's 18 picnic tables. Those are free to the public. They can actually permit those out for events. Um, and then there's also, of course, a children's play area, um, as well as a terrace that can accommodate up to 40 people. And there's a picture of some of our tennis, I'm sorry, our picnic um, tables. This is the outdoor terrace. We do hold uh, contract classes now and then out on here, the yoga and so forth. That's our uh, children's play area. And then um, we also have center-based programs that take place at the facility. Tot time, which is for mothers to bring, you know, um, their toddlers and fathers. Um, it's open every Monday and Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, again, the drop-in basketball and volleyball is very popular at the facility. We do offer life learning, long learning classes. Um, there is a full day day camp at Maple Park actually going on right now where there's over 85 kids. Um, the camp is from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., very popular. I mean, it's, um, it's a low-cost camp for, you know, the, um, the residents to go out and leave their kids when the um, parents are at work. Um, and then we also have a rec room, as I mentioned. Um, the Club Maple program also takes place at Maple Park. Um, it's a program for adults with developmental disabilities, um, open to any adult 18 or over with a condition um, of a you know, disability. Um, the program is every Thursday, 5.30 to 8. Um, we do do lots of fun events. Uh, I think Commissioner Sharkey has been there a couple of times for some of our events. Um, we do have a summer barbecue coming up in July. Um, that's a picture of Club Maple. It's a very popular program. This is a picture of our STARS Day Camp, which is actually going on as we speak. Um, another fun program that the kids um, you know, enjoy. With, um, with that, we also have a Flix on the Go package that we run out of Maple Park. Basically, it's an outdoor movies package. Um, it's our large inflatable screen that we come out and bring. Uh, it's open for private rentals um, and also for nonprofits, and those are the rates. Um, if you're interested, just give me a call at 818-548-3783. Questions? Questions, comments? Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm always amazed at all we do in Glendale. It's thank just you. amazing. Yeah, thank you.
Yeah, my head is spinning, yeah. And next. Next, we have item 7E, monthly activity reports at one, workforce development. Mr. President Foud, um, you do have the monthly activity reports in your packet, unless you have any questions. Uh, the only report that I would like to uh, present and highlight is the park planning and development report. We haven't talked about the status of our capital improvement projects in some time. So with your indulgence, I can go ahead and give you uh, an update on, on our uh, capital improvement projects in progress. Yeah, please do. Thank you. Uh, we have the artificial turf, the sports complex project, which was completed in May. That was a $900,000 project. And we used uh, enterprise funds to, uh, to fund that. And that project includes two soccer fields um, at the sports complex and a perimeter track. And one field we lined for lacrosse because lacrosse is, um, uh, we're starting to get more and more of a demand for uh, lacrosse. So we went ahead and lined one of the fields with, with lacrosse lines. Uh, at Fremont uh, Park, you got an update from uh, Gabrielle earlier. Uh, we replaced all of the tennis court lighting and resurfaced the tennis courts. A and at the same time, we installed new lighting at Dunsmore under the same uh, contract, construction contract. Uh, together, uh, that was an $800,000 project, of which $500,000 came from, again, the Enterprise Fund, and $300,000 came from the General Capital Improvement Fund. I'm sorry, remind me, what does the Enterprise Fund mean? The Enterprise Fund is the the fee for services that we are able to collect from uh, residents for um, um, rentals. Services. Um, yeah, services, classes, recreation classes, and, and whatnot. That's, that's about a $3.5 million um, uh, program. Um, and so over the years, we've been able to accumulate um, funds that we are now programming back into capital improvement projects. Uh, let's see. The... Uh, this project, project included 64 parking lots and park lights at Dunsmore and 24 poles and 64 lights at Fremont. So it's a significant lighting project. The demolition of Stenglefield Stadium and Brand North restroom uh, building started June 3rd last week. That is a $600,000 project of which 75000 is in general capital improvement funds and 525000 is in develop, development impact fee funds. This is a 90-day construction period and uh, will include the installation of aluminum bleachers to see between 800 and 1,000 once the demolition is completed. Riverwalk Phase 2, very exciting to finally have this project off the ground. It's out to bid. We held a mandatory bidders conference um, on June 3rd. We had 16 potential contractors attend, which is a very high number. This is a $1.5 million project. 975,000 will come in state park funds, 475,000 in state transportation funds, and 50,000 in general capital improvement funds. So I'm giving you examples of how we're able to leverage all these different funding sources to continue to get our capital projects um, done. For the amount of contractors who bid, was it 6 2 oh, 16, or 16? 16. 16. 16. Yes. Uh, this project involves park improvements on the river walk from Flower to the confluence between the Verdugo Wash and the river, which is right under the 134 freeway. Bids are due later this month, and we will plan to go to City Council for approval to award a contract on July 14th. We have two projects we're currently working on at Brand Park. One is the Brand Wayfinding um, sign project, uh, where we've completed the uh, bidding, and we have a contractor, and, and we plan to go to City Council to award the contract on July 14th, and that will be for a contract amount of $130,000. So we're going we're gonna to be redoing all of the wayfinding signage at the park, um, and that's, that's, that's been a long time co coming. Then at Brand Park, we have a Brand Park lighting project, and we're in the process of completing a design-build assessment of the parking lot and park lighting to upgrade and enhance the lighting at the park. This is a $1.25 million uh, project. It is budgeted from a combination of $750,000 in public works funds and $500,000 in development impact fee funds. The Civic Auditorium Exterior Improvements, uh, you should be getting a report next month. Uh, we've completed the plans and specifications. The project entails exterior painting of the auditorium, 
new awnings on the south entrance, which is the lower entrance to the, the surface uh, parking lot. It, re it includes removal of the canopy at the north entrance, uh, new gates at the lower level uh, doors on the east entrance, and refurbished exterior light fixtures. This is estimated to cost between $250,000 and $300,000, and we are using enterprise funds for um, this project. Uh, we plan to submit a report to the Commission for re review and approval in July, and then to the City Council. The Palmer Park Improvement Project, this is a $2.5 million construction project. Design has been completed. Uh, the budget includes $1.1 million in developer and impact fee funds, $960,000 in state funds, and $755,000 in CDBG funds. Uh, we're planning to go, go to City Council in July to approve the plans and specifications and authorize bidding. The project entails a complete renovation of the park, including the irrigation system, new lighting, redesigned entrance, new, new fencing, uh, a renovated and expanded restroom uh, building, enhanced picnic areas, uh, new cooking stations, new site furnishings, uh, a new walking path, uh, six new pieces of outdoor fitness equipment, uh, one new full and one half basketball courts, a brand new wading pool uh, to comply with current day uh, standards, which will have a sloped beach uh, ADA access entrance um, and a new skate plaza. Um, so that is um, will be before City Council in the month for uh, to authorize us to bid that project out to start construction. Then lastly, we have the Fremont Park Master Plan, which we are second to last, which we are in the middle of. We did have our second committee meeting on May 27th. We had very good attendance. We had about 40 uh, residents attend the meeting. Uh, based on feed feedback from the first committee meeting, we had developed three concept plans and presented all three different schemes to the community for a feedback and to narrow down the three concept ideas to one plan and based on the second round of input we are in the process of finalizing the concept plan that we would propose to the Commission and then to the City Council for approval right now the main features include creating a drive-through path for uh, police a walking path for patrons around the entire perimeter of the park which currently does not exist relocating the maintenance garage and the model train building to a parking area south and across the street from the park uh, adding an artificial turf soccer field, which currently does not exist at the park. Adding a new community building and a new restroom building and tennis office. Um, the community building, again, currently does not exist. Replacing the wading pool with a water feature. Um, and adding 45 to 55 parking spaces and then relocating the playground more towards the center of the park um, and redoing the lighting. This is all based on feedback that we got from the community in terms of how we can make the park uh, more functional to meet their needs. We anticipate that all told this, we're talking about a four or five million dollar project. Thus far, we've a, a budgeted 2.150, so we, we still have to finalize our funding plan. And the master plan should be completed uh, in a couple of months and, and again, ready for submittal to the commission for, for review and approval, if not in July, in August. And needless, needless to say, that's a major project. Then another very exciting project is the Duke Majan Barn Adaptive Reuse for Interpretive Center and Reception Venue. Um, this is the, the historic uh, Le Messonnier Barn at Duke Majan Park. On June 2nd, uh, the City Council approved plans and specifications for construction of mechanical systems, which include uh, plumbing, electrical, HVAC, and flooring uh, at an estimated cost of $500,000. Right now, the, the barn is just a shell. There's, there's nothing in the barn except the dirt floor and the wall. So this will begin to build out the mechanical systems. Then this work will be followed by the issuance of an RFP to design the interior improvements, including display spaces and construction of a new restroom building so that we can begin to turn it into um, a, a museum um, an interpretive center, then the idea there is on the weekends and during the day, it will be um, an educational center with all the uh, historic displays in the center and against the walls. And then in the evenings or for rental, as a rental venue, the displays will be portable so they will either be uh, lifted and out of the way or 
uh, we'll be able to push them to the side and, and we'll be able to set up um, seating in the center for a dual purpose of, of the barn. And we feel it will be a very, very popular reservation uh, a venue with its unique setting and everything else. Uh, the budget for this project, all told, is $2.5 million, and it's all coming from developer impact fees at this juncture. And we plan to have the entire project completed, and the center finally opened as it was envisioned in early 2017. So we still have quite a ways to go, but we're taking very significant steps now to get that done. And that completes the update for the um, capital improvement uh, report. Uh, thank you. Any comments or questions? These are dreams come true. I remember talking about Duke Meiji and Wilderness, the barn, a long time ago. It's great to see these things coming into reality. It's great news. Uh, I don't think we have any more items. Um, we do not. And just for the record, um, President Fodd, that was item 7E5, Park Planning and Development. And for item 7E1, 2, 3, and 4, um, re written reports were submitted, and the commission had no questions, correct? I think that's correct, yes. Other than that, next is adjournment. Do I hear a motion? Do adjourn? Yes. We don't need a motion. I don't need a motion? Well, we're adjourned. Thank you very much.